Good morning. Welcome back to the Broadcast Retirement Network. I'm Jeff Snyder. This is BRN Weekly for Saturday, July 3rd, 2021. And our top story today, the jobless rate for teens is the lowest since the 1950s. Well, joining me now to discuss this and a lot more is Serdar Berinci. He's an economist with the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. Serdar, it's great to see you. Thanks so much for joining us on the program this morning. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and you know, our, the purpose of us talking this morning is really to talk about some of the job information that you and the folks at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis have compiled. And maybe before we start talking about that information, let's talk about who or what Fred is. Okay, thanks. Thanks for the question. So Fred means Federal Reserve Economic Data. It's actually an easy to use and free online database. It is created and maintained by the research department at the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. And it provides hundreds of thousands of economic data from national, international, public or private sources. And it actually goes beyond just providing the data. It allows you to display time series with an easy to use interface. Like, and it's widely used by researchers, by policymakers, and by the media, not only in the US, but also across across different countries across the world. And suppose that I want to know what the labor force participation is right now and how it compares to say 10, 15 years ago or even 50 years ago in the US. Fred allows you to do that. You can plot the time series and see it with an easy to use inter interface. Or suppose that I want to know what is the labor force participation rate across different demographic groups, across different US states, or say even across even different countries. And again, all of these things that you can do in the FRED, it's it's a quite useful and fun database actually to work with. Yeah, and, and so if you want the actual data, the underlying data, it's there and free to use for any anybody as long as you have some level of internet access, either through your phone or your laptop or exactly. other device. Exactly. Uh, so let's talk about some of the data. And I, you know, it's always great to be able to speak with researchers like yourself who look at this information. And I guess my first question is, broadly speaking, when you look at employment and you look at job opportunities uh, during this pandemic, what what can you take away from the numbers as you see them? Hmm. So yeah, at the start of the pandemic, we definitely experienced a deep crisis, but this crisis was actually a transitory crisis. So if you look at the rate at which employed people lose their jobs, so-called the job separation rate or job loss rate, it exhibited an off-the-chart increase at the start of the at, at the start of the pandemic. So the monthly job separation rate increased from actually about one percent to about ten percent, which is the historical highest number or value for the for this for this empirical moment. And this rise unfortunately, was especially driven by the rise in the job separation rate of low income workers. If we divide, like imagine that we divide, we take the income distribution in the US and we divide it to five bins that are equally spaced. And let's look at the bottom group, their job separation rate, the, the, the rate at which employed people lose their job from this bottom group, increased from 2% to about 20%. Mm. But at the top, this job separation rate increased from less than 1% to about only 4%. So this crisis actually disproportionately affected those who were employed in the low paying jobs, especially in the service sector that are contact intensive. But the good yeah. news was that this, yeah, go ahead. No, no, I'm sorry, I cut you off. I was gonna say, when we talk about the service sector, we're probably talking about restaurants, hotel, hoteliers, other uh, you know, places that were really hit hard because they were closed during the pandemic. Exactly, exactly. So, and these jobs are typically lower paying jobs and em employed individuals who were working in this kind of s service sector uh, or entertainment uh, uh, industries, they, they were actually disproportionately affected by, the, by, by this pandemic at the start. But the good news was that this was a temporary crisis. Now we have higher, higher rates are up, actually higher than their pre-pandemic uh, pre levels. Job separation rates are back to their uh, pre-pandemic levels as well. So this crisis was a deep one, but actually it was a transitory one. And this is very different than say what happened during the Great Recession. During the Great Recession, we have a much longer period of a crisis. It was much deeper. And the recovery from the Great Recession took 
at least five years. And another, just, just to tell you, another important uh, indicator that uh, shows that it shows us that the labor market is working properly is the rate at which employed people changes jobs. So this is called job to job transition rate. This is important because research shows that a job to job transition rate is actually a good indicator of the future wage growth. This is intuitive because most of the people uh, leave their jobs and take another job uh, when they are offered higher salaries. So if the economy has a higher job to job transition rate, the rate at which employed people changes jobs, then that is correlated with the higher future wage growth. People are just simply because they are taking jobs with higher pay. And now, if you look at the job to job transition rate for the COVID episode, what happened was that at the start, there was a slight decline. But now the job ladder is preserved, it seems, because we see this uh, quick recovery of the job to job transition rate nowadays. And this is a good sign because it tells us that the wage growth is going to be solid coming out of this crisis. And again, this was different than what happened during the Great Recession. During the Great Recession, we saw a much larger decline in the job to job transition rate. So job ladder was destroyed. And the recovery from the job to job of, from the Great Recession for this job to job transition rate took around five years. And partly because of that, despite the Fed implementing was implementing this uh, expansionary monetary policy after the Great Recession. The economy experienced a very small uh, wage growth after the Great Recession for a long time. This is partly because the broken job ladder, job to job transition rates were actually very low and the recovery of that after the Great Recession was, was very slow. But this time I am hopeful because job to job transition rates are recovering quite fast and early data is actually showing us that uh, wage growth is going to be solid. This is important, especially for those low paying, uh, for those workers who were previously employed in low paying jobs and who are now finding again uh, some job opportunities in the low paying uh, sectors in the service industry. And we are hoping that job ladder is preserved in that sector as well and they, their wage growth is going to be solid. And early data confirms that. Yeah, well that's that's really great news and, and it's nice to know that we're not going through the similar cycle to what happened in 2008 because that was really a difficult time for many, uh, even though the pandemic was difficult as well. It seems to be a little bit more elastic. Uh, Serdar, last question. Let's talk, you know, we're entering the July 4th holiday weekend and, uh, you know, the time for teenagers, uh, young people to get jobs, get opportunity, get some experience under their belt. Maybe they're making money for college, making they're making money to save for a house. Are there opportunities out there today for teenage workers, young people looking to gain that experience? I think so. There are good reasons to believe that labor markets are, are operating per perfectly again, but at least properly again. I mentioned that hires are up and actually it's higher than its pre-pandemic levels. And the only concern we have nowadays is that, especially in the service sector, some firms uh, are still experiencing these labor shortages. They are not really finding enough workers that they need. Some, some, some firms are some businesses, some restaurants are operating under capacity right now. And I am thinking this might be something useful for young teenagers actually, because they can find these job opportunities in the service sector jobs or service sector uh, firms. And during the summer, they can take these opportunities and hopefully start their career. And given that actually, if you look at this, I was mentioning this job to job transition rate, job to job transition rate, meaning the wage growth is always higher for young individuals. So, you know, they can start a quick job during the summer and hopefully find even better paying jobs. And then they can transition to a, to a more like career looking jobs uh, in, a, in a short period of time after the summer and hopefully they will they will be having a proper and good time in this in this recovering labor market. Well, I hope I hope you're right. And, you know, look, I, I started my in high school. I, I worked on construction sites and I transitioned um, to working in a cabinet making career and then kind of went to went to school and did some other things. But it's a really great baseline for so many people to get that experience and also earn some income that they can put towards their expenses or save. Serdar, we're going to have to leave it there. Really appreciate you coming on the program, kind of breaking down some of these numbers. And we look forward to having you and the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis on the program again very soon. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. Thank you. Thanks, Serdar. Great to see you. Thanks for sharing your perspective. And when we come back, we'll take a look at some of our best segments for the week. 
You're going to want to stay tuned right here on BRN Weekly. Imagine a new television network that will make you richer, healthier, and in control of your financial future. This network is for the policewoman in Nashville, Tennessee, the baker in Dubuque, Iowa, the teacher in Lexington, Kentucky. We want to make the idea of savings and retirement culturally relevant. But what do you see as a defining issue of the midterms? Especially for the smaller businesses, I mean, they are the lifeblood of the American economy. Featuring exclusive interviews, current affairs, and docu-series. 33 yeah. years old, you retired early. The philosophy is money only matters if it helps you live a life that you love. But you gotta start thinking about retirement as soon as you get in. The Broadcast Retirement Network will drive very high engagement with premium partnerships. So this isn't retirement and savings for your parents or grandparents. This is for all Americans. And we're gonna change the way you think about money. Welcome to the next frontier of retirement and savings. This is BRN, the Broadcast Retirement Network. Are you stuck with a low credit score? A credit report and score that's causing you to be denied credit or pay higher interest rates than others for the same things? Then do what Terrence did and call Credit Repair for your free credit evaluation to help restore your credit. I started thinking about buying a new house and my score wasn't where I needed it to be. I called and spoke with one of the representatives and we just had a good conversation and I, I liked what he was saying. Just one call for his free credit evaluation was all it took to start back on the track to repairing his credit. I'm seeing the deletions and I'm getting the report so I know something's being done. It does make a difference to me. All it takes is one call to get started. Credit Repair has given me a second chance to have a better credit score. Don't let a low credit score hold you back another day. Do what Terrence did and make the call for your free credit evaluation. Call 800-819-4152. That's 800-819-4152. Again, 800-819-4152. Welcome back. On Wednesday, I sat down with Principal Financial Group's Shri Reddy to discuss the differences between how employers and employees view their retirement outlook. Let's take a look. This is a trend that we've seen in the retirement industry now going on two plus decades, and that's participants generally feel better about their plan and prognosis than their plan sponsors or employers do. And, and we saw that in the most recent survey with uh, almost a 20 point gap between the confidence levels of employers have versus participants have. And, and we attribute that to a number of reasons that we can get into. But bottom line is, I think employers realize, hey, my employees are not planning enough and preparing enough. And I'm not entirely confident they're going to have enough. Whereas participants are saying, you know what, I think I'm probably going to be better off than, than people think. Or I'm probably more ready than, uh, than, than not. There, there are a number of reasons, uh, but I'll tee up what we believe are the top three or four reasons. First sure. and foremost, we know in this country that the average American changes employers every three plus years or so. Now, why is that important to recognize? The 401k balance and the 401k account that an employer sees may not be a full picture of everything the participant has. That's point one. Point two, even though we in the industry earmark certain balances for retirement, individuals don't necessarily think about it that way. They have all sorts of rainy day buckets, including their home equity, that they factor in as part of their retirement planning. The third attribute I'll tee up is, and we've all been seeing this, we've been, at the, uh, we've been on the end of a bull market run that's been going on now for the better part of 12, 13 years. Stock market valuations are an all-time high. I think people's wealth effect is representing that. And people, when they feel wealthier, generally feel like they're more prepared. And the last one I'll tee up uh, for your audience is in something I'm a big believer in, is human and personal resilience. There are a number of adjustments that individuals can make that are not necessarily academically guided, 
but that will help them bounce back and probably give them more confidence than that employers could see based on all the needs and awareness that they have. I think one of the really more important points of awareness we need to create is when you think about the people who offer a 401k plan, it's much more prevalent with larger employers. Employers that have less than 500 employees have a much uh, lower rate of participating and providing a 401k plan at the work site. That's important to recognize because this pandemic has completely been, uh, it's been unbalanced. It's affected smaller employers who are in the service industry that typically employ a disproportionate amount of women and minorities over other groups. So while we're asking the question, uh, I think the impacts from COVID aren't necessarily fully fully reflected in the numbers. Let's look at even the short-term impacts I have a, a hunch that masks will become more mainstream and are probably going to stay longer than people expect. There are people who are looking at their employment and saying, well, I don't have to live in a particular city. I don't have to work for an employer that's local. So my opportunity set might be wider. There's others who are saying, I've lost a loved one unexpectedly. Do I really want to reframe what my priorities are? So COVID is impacting people in very different fashions, depending on your experience and proximity to it. But I agree with you that there are a lot more unknown unknowns than there are known unknowns. And, and what I've teed up uh, to your audience in the past and through other media as well, is there's four things that I focus on. That's access to a work, work site-based savings plan, participation, adequacy, and addressing longevity. And unless all four pieces of the pie or puzzle are addressed, it's really hard to solve for a problem that gets people to and through retirement in a meaningful fashion. So let's talk about what those four things mean and how uh, advisors and others can help employers do this. First and foremost, we know that if you have a worksite-based plan, it works. People fundamentally participate if they have access to one. But to my earlier point, smaller employers don't necessarily offer them. Uh, They'll say it's not necessarily in demand. It's too complex to offer. The administrative burden's high. The good news is there's pooled employer plans. There's vehicles like that that are coming out that offer smaller employers to have the same cost and pricing advantages that larger employers do and make these things available. So that's first and foremost. The second is you need to have conversations to encourage participation. So whether you do that through default mechanisms, auto-enrollment, re-enrollment, there have been lots of things and guidance from the DOL and others, including the SECURE Act, which makes it easier for plan sponsors to help make those uh, the choice architecture easier for participants. The third one, and I'm really excited about this, uh, years ago when default language came out, DOL and others use a 3% example. You can default people in a 3%. And for example, unless you turn it off, they continue to contribute. Well, we all know being in the industry, 3% is not going to cut it. 3% doesn't solve any amount of number. And if you get close to that 10% mark is where it's actually going to be meaningful. And, and I think we've seen both in our own data the more, even if you increase the default rate, the opt-out rates are still about the same. So with the advent of SECURE, CARES Act, even giving the ability for people to save more uh, more early on and save more longer because of delayed RMDs and the like will help with adequacy. And so we've solved access, participation, and adequacy. Now we're going to talk about longevity. SECURE Act, although the timing because of COVID wasn't optimal, really had some uh, interesting provisions in it from both the lifetime income illustration to an annuity safe harbor, as well as some portability language. And I I think although COVID created a chilling effect on the marketplace, uh, given uncertainty, I think employers, uh, this is a prime time to start investigating options and for advisors to become experts to start having those conversations as well. And on Friday, I sat down with California's public interest retirement groups, Jen Engstrom, to discuss the increase of complaints with mobile payment apps. Let's take a look. Um, yeah, CalPERC, the California Public Interest Research Group, um, a public interest group, a consumer advocacy group, we're really about making sure that we have you know, healthy, secure, safe futures for everybody. Um, and we often you know, stand up to um, powerful special interests to just make sure that we are working to build a future for everybody. First of all, I'll say that it is true that these payment apps are on the rise. Um, so consumers are increasingly using apps like Venmo, PayPal, you know, Cash App, and Zelle um, as just a you know quick and easy way um, to share money with a friend or you know make a make a purchase. And they have been on the rise. In particular, this year we have seen that they have been on the rise. And we think a lot of that is because they are, you know, pretty convenient. Like I 
use them when I go out to have dinner with friends. Just one of us pays the bill and the rest of us, you know, use Venmo to pay each other back. And that can just be really easy. Um, but we also were seeing it, you know, rise because of people wanting these kind of contactless transactions, you know, with the pandemic as well. Um, so overall, there's just been a, an increase in the use of these apps. Um, and while they are convenient, they just don't come without problems. Um, so we've also just seen a rise in complaints um, from consumers using these apps as well. Well, part of the problem is that because it is so easy, it can lead to problems. So these digital payment apps are instantaneous which is convenient, but it generally can mean that they're also irreversible. And that can lead to errors, like accidentally typing in a friend's username wrong and sending money to the wrong person. Um, so really, you know, common example um, of just accidentally sending money to the wrong person. I, I talked to one student from UC San Diego, Tiara, um, who tried to use a Venmo app to just pay back a friend $100 for a few ride shares. And she just accidentally typed in one letter wrong in her friend's username and sent it to the wrong person and just an unknown person. She asked that person to, that she accidentally sent the payment to, to pay her back, but they didn't respond. <laughs> um, and then she reached out to Venmo and never heard back. And so she just kind of, you know, took it as an accident and wasn't able to get that hundred dollars back. And this is pretty common and often because consumers don't realize how instantaneous these transactions are and that they're not really reversible. And right now, consumers have very few consumer protections when they use a payment app or service. Um, customer service for these apps is pretty minimal, sometimes lacking a you know, phone number to contact or any human interaction at all. And that's why we're starting to see just a rise in complaints to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau because um, people are just experiencing problems you know, bad enough. They're not quite sure what else to do. And so they you know, file a complaint with this government agency to get things resolved. Yeah, and that's exactly what we're calling on these companies to do and calling on policymakers and the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau to help us to make this happen. Um, really, the things that we want to see is that, you know, consumers are protected even when they're defrauded into sending money or even when the consumer themselves, you know, initiated. Um, and currently, consumer-initiated transactions are just not protected and not in the definition of unauthorized charges. Um, and so, it, you know, it's true that it's just way easier now to make these, you know, accidental or unauthorized charges. And we really need to update the, you know, policies to be able to protect consumers. Well, certainly great segments. I want to thank all of our contributors this week. And that wraps up this episode of BRN Weekly. Have a topic of interest, someone you think we should talk to, drop us a line. And don't forget, for all the information in retirement markets, technology, personal finance, so much more, check out today's edition of our daily newsletter, The Morning Pulse. Well, tomorrow's Independence Day, and we will have an edition of BRN Sunday. Until then, I'm Jeff Snyder. Stay safe, keep on saving, and don't forget, roll with the changes. Are you being audited? And do you owe the IRS $10,000 or more in back taxes? Is the IRS threatening to take more of your money? Don't fight the IRS alone. The Tax Doctor is here to help you negotiate your tax bill and reduce your stress. The IRS can freeze your assets and seize your bank accounts, but you can stop these IRS actions. The Tax Doctor will work with you using our years of experience to represent your case to help you get the best resolution under the IRS guidelines. Help is here to deal with the IRS to reduce your stress. We've handled thousands of cases, so we know what we're doing. If you owe $10,000 or more in back taxes, do not call the IRS alone. Call a Tax Doctor now for a tax emergency analysis. Call 800-224-6439.